a man named Mike Donahay grew up going to Sunday school. It's an event in some church programs where children are gathered together in a room and taught stories from the Bible. One morning, Mike's Sunday school teacher brought out the felt board, a giant fuzzy board where she could stick cut out paper characters and tell a story. On this particular day, Mike's teacher started talking about Jesus, and she said, Now let me tell you about Jesus' disciples. Here's Peter. Peter doubted. That was bad. And here's Thomas. And he doubted too. Not very good. But then she pointed to a particular figure on the board. But here, she said, here's John. John is the disciple that Jesus loves. Mike, at this point, sitting in the group of children, gasped, and raising his hand, he says eagerly, I want to be the disciple Jesus loves. But the teacher said, "Uh Uh-uh, John. John was Jesus' best friend. And Mike again excitedly raises his hand and says, I want to be Jesus' best friend. "Uh Uh-uh, says the teacher, John. Now this didn't sit well with Mike. It didn't sit well with him that Jesus had a best friend. He thought it kind of went against Jesus' M.O. of loving everybody, and having a favorite or showing favoritism seemed somehow wrong. Even today, when we read this in the Bible, we too might think, this seems a little unfair or strange or even unlike Jesus. Now, the only place where John is called the disciple Jesus loved is in the book that he, John, wrote himself. So it gets further problematic, doesn't it? Because it's John himself who is making this claim in the very book that he wrote. One can almost imagine being one of the other disciples— Peter, Thomas, Bartholomew, Philip, reading this in John's account and coming up to this line, the disciple Jesus loved? Hey, he loved us too. One of the other disciples was even John's own brother called James. As modern readers, we might think, how did that make him feel? And as readers today, we might also read this statement and react by saying, Who does John think he is? Well, let's have a look. Who does John think he is? Who was John? John was one of the twelve first called disciples of Jesus. He is thought to have been the youngest in the group based on how long he lived, and it's estimated he began following Jesus when he was between 16 and 18 years of age. He is the author of the Gospel according to John, three epistles, as well as the Book of Revelation. He is also today known for other things. For example, in John chapter 13, one of the very chapters in which John refers to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved, we read the scene of what is called the Last Supper. Jesus is celebrating the festival of Passover with his disciples in a rented upper room in Jerusalem. And during this meal that they're having together, we can read in verse 23, One of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Now this picture of John sitting next to Jesus has been depicted again and again in artwork through the years. Often he is painted as sitting, leaning his head on Jesus' shoulder, or simply sitting very close to him. Most English translations will look something similar to the wording we just read, but if we look for a moment at the original language, a better translation would be, reclining there, in the bosom of Jesus, was one of his disciples, the one whom Jesus loved. Now, this language creates an even closer, more affectionate and warm picture. He's not merely resting his head on Jesus' shoulder, but as the text describes, he's in the bosom of Jesus, on his chest as they reclined around the table. In this scene, John is literally a bosom friend. 
Imagine being described in this way, so close to Jesus. That's quite a thing to be known for. Another example of something the character of John is often known for, we find unfolding in the scene of the cross. In John chapter 19, a dying Jesus sees his mother Mary there. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son, and to the disciple, Here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. So while all the disciples fled when Jesus was arrested by his enemies, only John returns to the scene of his execution. Only he comes and stands by the cross, and it is to him that Jesus entrusts his own mother, charging John to take care of her. Following Jesus since he was a teenager, being close enough to Jesus to rest his head on his chest, being present at the crucifixion, being given custody of Jesus' mother, and much more. Now that is quite a list of things to be known for. And in looking at this list, you'll likely come to the conclusion, John was a pretty outstanding disciple. If it was us, if we were John, we might very likely be tempted to talk about all our accomplishments. And John could have described himself, quite rightfully, in many honourable and complimenting ways. But what does he do? When it comes down to defining himself, to identifying himself in the story, he doesn't define himself by anything he did or accomplished for God. No, he wrapped it up in this, that I am the disciple whom Jesus loves. Love is a topic John goes on to talk a lot about. It's the central message in his letters to the churches that believed in Jesus as the Messiah. He often addresses the churches, the readers of his letters, as beloved, dear you who are loved. In 1 John 4.10 he writes, This is love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us. Meaning, in spite of our failures or in spite of our successes, our identity is secure, because it's not wrapped up in what we do for God, but what He does for us. One of the first questions adult humans ask each other when being introduced is, so what do you do? In other words, what's your work? What's your occupation, your career or your job? Along with your name, this is one of the biggest identifying factors which we use to define ourselves to others. But if we return again to this belief that John writes about in John 4 we're ushered into a new understanding of defining ourselves. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us. Through this other lens, we can be set free from this narrow, performance-centered identifying. I am no longer musician or teacher. Your identity is not failure or success, your work or your accomplishments, your weaknesses, or your productivity. Your identity is held securely because it's not dependent on what you do or even how much you love. But love is found and built on the fact that God loves us. This is what anchors your identity. This is the unshakable truth about who you are. We said at the beginning that it might be easy to conclude that John defining himself as the disciple that Jesus loved is the most arrogant thing he could have done. But this is failing to understand what John was really saying. He wasn't claiming to be favored over the others or better than the other disciples. His claim was wasn't the most arrogant thing, but the most humble thing he could have done. 
He doesn't list off a title, accomplishments, successes, victories, struggles or position. He defines himself as loved by Jesus. This to him is the most important defining thing about him. It even takes precedence over his name. This is the same identity which anyone who follows Jesus is invited into. You are the disciple whom Jesus loves. It has nothing to do with what you've done or what you didn't do, and it has everything to do with how important you are to him. And herein lies the freedom from the torment of trying to earn and prove our worth and our belonging. Let us define ourselves by this. Return again and again to this root identity. Be secure and safe and assured in this truth, that you are the disciple whom Jesus loves.